Hello, and welcome to Premier's Advisor Live. My name is Elise Pegler. I'm a principal on Premier's Population Health Team and the Premier Lead for the Perioperative Surgical Home Collaborative. I'll be your moderator today. The objectives of today's call are to learn how to see specialists as a way to reduce the total cost of care, improve a patient's quality of life, improve the patient and the specialist experience, the quadruple aim, and understand how to best manage the entire surgical episode from the decision of the need for an invasive procedure, surgical, diagnostic, or therapeutic, to discharge and beyond. We're so excited for you to learn how to improve your total cost of care of savings utilizing a cross-continuum perioperative team. So thank you so much for joining us. We are recording today's call. You'll be able to watch the recording by visiting the past events section of premierinc.com slash events later this week. That's where you'll also find a printable version of today's slides. I will also email you a link in the next couple of days. We've set aside an hour for today's event and we'll be taking your questions throughout the webinar. You can submit your questions at any time using the question and answer space on the left-hand side of the screen and we'll answer your questions at the end of the presentation. We really encourage you to chat those questions in. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our speakers. We're so pleased to be joined by Chris Steele, MD, who's the Medical Director for the Perioperative Surgical Home Collaborative 2020, and the Director of Anesthesia at White River Health System in Arkansas. Dr. Steele trained in anesthesiology at Penn State Hershey Medical Center. He's been a director of anesthesia services at White River Health System for the past five years, and he currently serves as the medical director of the ICU, PCU, and the Community Care Network, and he's co-director of the perioperative surgical home for White River Health System, and he also co-founded Episode Health Experts, LLC, and Physician Impact. We're also joined by Mike Schweitzer, MD, MBA, who's the chief of population health at Verity Health. Dr. Schweitzer is the Chief Population Health Officer for Verity Health System. He collaborates with system, hospital, and physician leadership for negotiation and coordination of managed care contracts, risk-based contracts, and payer relationships. He is leading the development of population health alternative payment models, such as bundled payments, co-management agreements, and accountable care organizations. And last but not least, we're joined by Joe Demore. Uh, FACG and MBA was the Vice President of Population Health at Premier Inc. Joe is the Vice President of Population Health and he is responsible for assisting physician groups, health systems, and health plans in implementing population health management and value-based arrangements in areas such as strategic business planning, clinical integration, quality and financial improvement, and population health management capabilities. And prior to joining Premier, Joe served as the president and CEO of Mission Health System in Asheville and Sparrow Health System in Lansing, Michigan. And now I'd like to turn it over to Joe. Thanks, Elise. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and good morning to those of you on the West Coast. Um, we're really excited to uh, talk a little bit about uh, the perioperative surgical home model and r really health reform. Uh, we're all moving on this uh, really challenging transformation from the traditional pay for volume to pay for value. And, and, and this uh, model is a part of that movement uh, which is continuing to grow across the country. Um, it, it's a challenge to cross that bridge, and, and you need a number of key uh, core capabilities uh, to do that. And, and you have two experts, I think, physicians who are going to talk about those key core co key components and capabilities that are absolutely essential for success in this transformation. Uh, what's making this transformation even more critical is the fact that there's a dwindling uh, payment model uh, in the fee-for-service world. Uh, the strategy, we believe, of the federal government and many other payers is to make the fee-for-service payment model uh, more and more challenging so organizations will want to shift across this bridge and move to uh, more of a, a value-based payment model. And we're seeing that across America uh, today. The, the, the key thing that you're going to hear from these two uh, very, very uh, bright people is, uh, one, uh, that you've got to build the, the value-based care model and redesign care in a way 
that adds value, adds value to the patient, adds value to the payer, adds value to the treatment team. And then at the same time, begin to build these value-based payment arrangements so that you're basically monetizing the new model. And that's what we're going to try to talk a little bit about today. Of course, we have a limited amount of time, so we're not going to be able to get through all of the details of how to do that, but we're going to give you a pretty good idea of how successful organizations are crossing this bridge and moving to this new model. Uh, I think it's even more critical. As a former hospital CEO, we all know that surgical volume and surgery is a highly profitable area for most hospitals in America. And, and as we see a shift in volume to an outpatient basis, even, even procedures like total joints are starting to shift to an outpatient basis. It's going to make profitability uh, in your surgical arena even more challenging. And you're going to learn here how you can improve your processes, your workflow, in a way that will lower costs, which will even improve your profitability in, in volume-based payment, traditional payment. Uh, and it will help you prepare for this transformation to value-based payment. So, so think of it as a double win, winning in the short term and then winning in the long term. Uh, there are a lot of key components to changing that delivery model, uh, and, and I won't go through them all because uh, there, there's a, a, a lot of areas that are critical to success, but just maybe point out a couple. One is that this model is so positive because it's physician-led clinical integration. Um, the model has been endorsed by many professional societies across the country, uh, the Orthopedic Society, American Society of Anesthesiology, many professional societies. So it's e a little easier to get physicians engaged, specialists engaged in this transformation process because their professional societies have endorsed it. And, and I think that's a real plus in developing uh, a model like this. But because it engages specialists, the ACO model, I think, is a good model, but it has not really been effective in engaging specialists. And the perioperative surgical home, I think, is a, is a really good model because it also uses a quadruple aim, you know, the health of the population, cost per capita, cost per procedure, uh, improving patient quality, satisfaction, engagement, incre incre increasing engagement, and improving provider satisfaction, all key components of, of this model. As I mentioned earlier, surgical costs are a significant driver in total costs, uh, and, and if you look at how that has changed over time, it's, it's really grown. And uh, managing your surgical costs is critical. And this model will help you do that. As I said, even under traditional fee-for-service, you're going to improve your, your margin, your profitability. And at the same time, this is going to position you for episode of care payment, bundle payment, shadow bundles, and, and even ACOs. So that's why we think uh, those of us who work in the field of trans transitioning to value-based care and value-based payment think this model uh, is so successful. Uh, so, uh, again, uh, I, I know you're going to enjoy uh, our two experts who are going to talk about their success. Th these two physicians have both not only uh, advocated for this model but have successfully implemented it at places so th they can bridge the gap between theory and practice. So please ask them questions as, as they're very familiar uh, with this model. So now I'll, I'll turn it over uh, to our next speaker who's going to talk about the history of uh, perioperative care. Thanks. Thanks so much, Joe. I really appreciate you. We're going to talk a little about the history of perioperative care. As an anesthesiologist, I've had a, the ability to see care from a little different perspective, and I think we all know some of the problems that traditional surgical care involves, which is caregivers working in silos, the decision to have surgery is typically in a completely different place than where surgery actually takes place, and the recovery from that surgery is in a completely different area as well. So that tends to lend toward working in silos. 
and, and along with disjointed phases of care. We also have a high variable cost in surgery from institution to institution, which we most institutions, when they focus on these, can bring these costs down by a, a myriad of different ways. We've seen delays, not just delaying the surgery itself, but delaying people getting to the operating room at, from the decision to have surgery, and along with variabilities in their length of stay. You'll see that differ inside institutions from surgeon to surgeon and at different institutions, their length of stay for the same procedure. Patients don't like this. They, they don't have the expectations set appropriately. They don't have the same people giving the same answers, and those are problems. We, we don't get the outcomes that we know we can if we adhere to the correct protocols. And unfortunately, post-acute care is quite variable as well. We get more people involving post-acute care, and people don't get back to work or get home as quick as they necessarily want to. We have these problems a lot of times because there isn't enough pre-procedural planning. There's way too much variability when it comes to pre-op assessment. Unfortunately, the people do, the surgeons tend to have, from surgeon to surgeon differ, the anesthesiologists differ, and the care in general tends to be quite variable. And based on provider preference rather than standardized protocols, Intraoperatively, typically, anesthesia, I can tell you from my profession, has been had a mantra that it's, a, that it's more of an art than a science, and so we lack reproducibility in those models. The postoperative management by the surgeon sometimes is based on anecdotal data due to experience, their long experience rather than cutting-edge protocols and reproducibility. And finally, the post-op care is sometimes dictated more on patient preference than it is on empiric data of where the best place for them to receive post-acute care would be. We know from a lot of experience in population health that the, the top 2 to 3% of the population is going to drive up to 40% of the cost of care. And as you can see here, this pyramid allows us to see where the specific costs go. And unfortunately, we don't necessarily spend the highest amount of time with the highest acuity patients because we don't screen them and know on the front end who are those top 2 to 3% super utilizers. And instead, we spend a lot of our resources on some of the patients that need very little. And that doesn't give us enough time to spend with the patients that do need it definitely the most. We were trying to find a collaborative methodology that would give everyone the ability to measure with defined metrics, to report, to then share the best practice and execute. And as you can see here, knowing is not enough. We've got to apply. And the willingness is not enough. We must do. And I think that's very important here because there's a lot of places that do have insight and innovation and struggle with execution, but you've got to be able to get all three of those things put together. And with the perioperative surgical home collaborative, we've taken that model and created a patient-centered, physician-led, interdisciplinary, team-based system of coordinated care. It spans the entire episode from the decision of the need for surgery or an invasive procedure to discharge and beyond. It, isn't, it doesn't just start when the patient gets cut on or when they arrive that day, but before that is when the standardization and expectations are set for surgery, and that allows us to focus on post-acute care once we set appropriate expectations for the patients so that they can be engaged in their care, so it's bidirectional. This was specifically designed to achieve the quadruple aim of improving the health of the patient increasing the satisfaction of the patient, reducing the cost of care, and lastly, increasing the provider satisfaction in this. And that's one thing that was left out. If you remember, the triple aim was preached for a long time, but when you leave providers out, unfortunately, you don't get the same level of care as if you involve providers in this protocol and uh, pathway. If you see, it starts at the upper left here, with a patient in the patient-centered medical home environment or with their PCP, and that patient then has a standardized protocol and pathway through their pre-op, intra-op, post-op, and their long-term recovery. And after that, they get smoothly transitioned back to their patient-centered medical home or their PCP. 
This is absolutely impossible to do unless you involve all the supporting microsystems of a hospital. You've got to engage your stakeholders like nursing, pharmacy, lab, HR, social services, um, IT, and it has to have huge buy-in from your administration to be able to pull things like this off. When you get a model like that, what you're allowed to do on the front end then is truly identify these high-risk people and tier the amount of time spent with them to spend more time with the high risk and less with those low risk patients and be able to truly achieve what we want to from an outcome standpoint. When, you're, when you start standardizing on the front end, it allows us time to focus on the back end. And that black hole is significant amount of cost that you're going to see there. And it's something that a lot of times far in from personal experience, something that I focused very little on in my training in the beginning of my career was what happened after they left the hospital. I think you've got to shine a light on the post-acute care phase. There's a lot of cost and a lot of variability going on. And sometimes when you just shine a light and look at the total length of stay and where they're going in their SNFs and LTACs, what you'll find out is you can actually reduce the total cost of care and improve quality by just figuring out what people are doing and what services patients actually need in that environment. We're not the first to do this, as you can see right here. The Medicare fee-for-service spending on post-acute care has started slowing since 2011. It coincidentally is the similar time that you started to see the rise in bundled payments, like the bundled payment for care improvement plan. And I think a lot of surgeons, both orthopedic, general surgeons, obstetric physicians, a lot of them have been able to look at not just their intraoperative and intra-hospital costs, but their post-acute care costs and figure out ways to streamline that while also decreasing readmission rates at the same time. Those things are definitely possible, but you can't do it without starting the preparation for that prior, at, prior to surgery at the decision to have surgery. Once you can focus on your post-acute care you per, and most people have heard of a, of a pre-op clinic, and a lot of these advanced institutions are, tra are changing their pre-op clinic to a transitional care clinic. So this pre-op clinic not only looks at patient engagement and assessment on the front end, they also look at coordination of care for discharge plans for patients after discharge. So they're allowed to educate patients. They're able to focus on who needs rehabilitation, how to prevent readmission, and screen these people to see what level of care they need on the back end. And there's actually charge codes that allow them to bill from a transitional care management code as well so that they can be that bridge from the discharge of the hospital to getting that patient back with their PCP or with their patient-centered medical home. So from that standpoint, this is great for patients and families who have questions about what to do with wounds, who may not be able to get a hold of their surgeon specifically, who may be in a clinic environment and not available sometimes. This pre-op clinic transition to a transitional care has been very helpful for organizations and helps them in a perioperative surgical home to truly bridge that gap post-discharge from the hospital to get where they need to get to. As you can see, this PSH care delivery model is fully aligned with the shift from volume to value. There's multiple programs that have been involved from BPCI to BPCIA to the Comprehensive Joint Replacement Program. It also aligns nicely with Medicare Shared Savings and many ACO population health measures, which really get part of a partnership going between the primary care doctors and the specialists. From a monetization standpoint, I think you've got opportunities with the PSH. We've seen co-management agreements with hospitals work quite nicely, hospital quality efficiency programs with the physician groups. There's also bundled payment opportunities for the physicians and hospitals to get aligned and opportunities with their ACOs. All these are ways that perioperative surgical homes can be set up to improve care for the, for the patients while allowing physicians both specialist and primary care to align their incentives with the hospital to provide better care overall. Next, uh, Dr. Schweitzer is going to talk to you a little about engaging the specialists as drivers of success. Thanks, Dr. Steele. And uh, in terms of monetization of the perioperative surgical home, all of those models that Dr. Steele just outlined, I've been involved with, and I know that they're very successful 
in engaging physicians and specialists and aligning the hospitals and physicians to be working together uh, in the same direction to provide higher quality of care with fewer complications, which ends up resulting in a decreased total spend over the continuum of care. So I'm going to be talking more a little bit about engaging specialists uh, for success. First, uh, just, just a brief outline of where I am now. I'm working with Verity Health. We have six hospitals in California. And uh, foundation, and the foundation model in California is you can, hospitals cannot employ physicians, and so we have a medical foundation that employs physicians. So we work with both independent physicians and employed physicians with Verity Health. I think we, when we look at bundled payments in the perioperative surgical home, both of them have one characteristic that we hold near and dear to our hearts, and that is we're focused on the individual goals of our patients. We want to identify what's the goal of my patient in this care process. Is it that they want to dance at their granddaughter's wedding? Do they want to take that favorite hike and go up fishing again? Or just walk the dog with my spouse again because I haven't been able to do that. So we really need to focus on what are the goals of the patients when we start taking care of them in the perioperative surgical home model. Physician champions must learn to lead. We are all selected to get into medical school and we succeeded in the medical school and residency, not because of our leadership skills, but because of a variety of other characteristics. We can learn how to be leaders, but oftentimes we haven't been exposed to leadership skills. So John Cotter wrote, uh, our iceberg is melting, and he outlines eight steps to take in terms of change management from creating a sense of urgency to building the guiding team and walking through how you do change and how you understand buy-in and empowering others and short-term wins and being relentless to create that new culture for change. I really suggest, if you haven't read Our Iceberg is Melting, to go out and buy it. It's a very short book, big print, lots of pictures. Uh, you can read through it in less than an hour, even if you get interrupted three or four times but it really gives you a great understanding of project management, chain management, and team leadership. This is an example here at Verity. We had a gala in May, uh, and we celebrated our physician leaders over the past several decades. All of these leaders had these characteristics, which they had the ability to influence their colleagues. They understood creating a sense of urgency. They were seen as reliable sources of information for, by their peers, and they had a passion for their project. And their project may have been transplant surgery or it may have been improving diabetes. All of these leaders had different passions and different projects that they were able to success, successfully in, implement it to St. Vincent's Hospital with Verity over the decades to improve the quality of care for our patients. Oftentimes people ask me, Mike, What's the best change management strategy? Is it PDCA, Plan, Do, Check, Act, you know, from Institute for Healthcare Improvement, or is it Lean, or is it a combination of Lean Six Sigma? Is it ADCAR? And I always answer one simple thing. What does your hospital use? Because you want to use the change management process that your hospital is using that your staff are familiar with. So become familiar with the change management strategy in your own hospital or your own health system and use that strategy uh, leverage that work with your performance improvement people so that you can change more rapidly in the language that's understood by the clinicians and the performance improvement folks in your organization. Well, here's some traditional physician hospital alignment strategies. There's the cultural alignment. You have to establish relationship and trust. If your trust is broken, the first thing you have to do is build trust. Sometimes it takes a few small steps moving forward uh, to build that trust. Oftentimes it helps to have an economic alignment, and I think that that monetization strategies that Dr. Steele outlined is a good way to start with that in terms of are you going to do a co-management agreement? Are you working with an HQEP? Are you looking at uh, medical directorships or incentives for your employed physicians? How is it exactly that you're going to align uh, the the needs of the physicians, the patients, and the hospital system to be successful in a perioperative surgical home. 
And this clinical alignment is mutually beneficial. First, again, it's, it succeeds in gaining the patient's goals to be functionally returning to their normal state quickly so that they can get back to work or dance at their granddaughter's wedding as they wish. And then, as Dr. Steele pointed out, we want to include the quadruple aim because we want to just not pile on more burden for the clinicians and physicians, but actually streamline their care so that they can get in and out of the hospital, in and out of their office, and enjoy their families. So working with physician champions, you need to work with them prior to the meetings. It's a lot about the pre-meeting. If you're going to be showing transparently data to a group of physicians, work with your physician champions. Present this data to them a week before the meeting. Have them go through it and say, wait a minute, let's change this, let's tweak this. Are you sure about that number? Let's validate that. Because the worst thing you can do is with a new physician champion, present data in front of a group of their colleagues and peers and then find out that some of the data is wrong or you're presenting the, the wrong graph or you have the wrong attribution. So allow your physician champions to go through that data that you're going to share transparently with the group uh, in several days ahead of time so that they can clean up and understand what the presentation is going to include. So this is a, a project management plan uh, from Six Sigma. It's called uh, DMAIC, Define, Measure, analyze, improve, control. And so it goes through the phases from identifying what your current state is, moving towards analyze, analyzing your data and establishing what a plan for success involves. And then at the center of this perioperative surgical home project action plan is really creating a plan of communication for your stakeholders. And when I say stakeholders, that includes uh, specialty physicians, primary care physicians, it includes nurses, it includes respiratory therapists and physical therapists and social workers and case managers, the executive suite, really everyone involved is on the provider side. And in addition to that, you, sometimes people overlook a stakeholder, which is very important, and that is a patient advocate and in involving the patient and the family or their caregivers in this project action plan. And some folks in their perioperative surgical home actually engage patient advocates as part of the team. And then the fourth phase is to the improvement phase so that you're identifying that what you've done is actually an improvement, and if it's not, then you go back and tweak it and adjust it so that it is, becomes an improvement in the future. And then finally, the control phase so that you maintain the gain in this process. This is a simple RACI chart. A RACI stands for Responsible, Accountable, Consulted, and Informed, and it really identifies in terms of the stakeholders what their role is in the project change management. Are they responsible for the action? Are they accountable for the action? Or are they just being informed about what's going on? Or are they being consulted about it? But every member, every member in your stakeholder team uh, has some role to play in the RACI chart. And sometimes they'll, be, uh, sometimes they'll have multiple roles as informed. Sometimes they'll have multiple roles as accountable. Sometimes you may have some champions that are uh, both responsible and accountable. Sometimes they're just being informed. So everyone has their own role, and it's, a perf it's important to understand what each stakeholder's role is in that process. So, Dr. Steele, do you want us walk, walk us through your perioperative surgical home pilot? Yeah. Um, you see in front of you the, uh, a lean canvas um, that gives you a good idea of what you're dealing with in your perioperative surgical home. It talks about your problem, solution, metrics, cost. And then on the other side, it talks about your value proposition, your advantage, your customer segments, and your revenue streams. I think some succinct uh, page like this is really important, especially when you're talking to C-suite and some other members of your hospital staff, that you can really in one small page show them what this is about. It's a good exercise as well because sometimes if they ask, when you first try to fill this out and you try and define a problem, it's going to take you like three pages to write all the problems down. And it really is a good exercise to be able to focus on what the real problems are because that allows you to focus on the solution. And it talks about the monetization and a lot of things that everyone cares about. I'd love to say we had the foresight 
to before we started to think about a lean canvas, but this came about two years after we got started. So me a culpa on that one. But for your standpoint, I think it's very important going forward to have a, a some type of paper like that. From our standpoint, those are the lenses you see in front of you. I really want that to be a looking glass because any employee in your organization, especially physicians, need to know how their little process measure of adhering to one small protocol leads to an outcome measure, how that outcome measure affects a quality scorecard for a whole department, and then how that department feeds all the way to the board report for the key performance indicators for an entire hospital system. If everyone at the organization knows exactly what their little small things may mean for a big scale, it gives us all purpose and it helps to align incentives so that we're all on the same team. I think once you get an idea of what you're going to do and what your vision is, you've got to do a, a, some degree of a perk chart. There's a lot of different things like Mike talked about. You've got to have some basic thing that walks you through what you're going to do and what the defined timeline on that you all agreed upon. Some people call it mutually agreed upon deliverables at a predefined timeline. That's a lot of words, but you've got to do something like that. And again, yeah, we kind of came up with this afterwards. So we learned a lot of things by experience of ne not necessarily starting the best way, but we, we made good outcomes, did a lot of strategic pivots. But I think these are very good things to focus on moving forward. And if you can start, it's wonderful to do that. When you put together a team to work on these projects, I think you really need to consider IT, surgery champion, administrative champion, a nursing champion, an anesthesia champion. These are key stakeholders. And lastly, we did hire a project manager. We, we got an MHA student to hire to, that we hired as an intern. And boy, they did a great job of keeping us all uh, out away from our rabbit trails and keep moving the project forward. That, that was very helpful. It, the IT is something that is absolutely essential. It's one of the downfalls I see is they get a lot of clinical people in there and get administrative support. But if you don't have support from your IT department, you're not going to be able to measure the progress you need and keep everyone engaged. And if you don't engage in nursing, the nurses touch the patients and take care of the patients more than the physicians do. And if they aren't on board with these and they're told what to do rather than ask what to do, it's probably not going to end very well. I want, I want you to remember when you're building these things that what drives or motivates people in Daniel Pink's book, Drive, he said autonomy, mastery, and purpose. So when you're talking about and trying to motivate people, try to give them autonomy. Allow them to achieve mastery. And again, kind of back to those lenses, show them the purpose of what they're doing. It's going to motivate people and get them engaged a lot more down the road. We didn't necessarily have the leadership skills and positions we needed. When we got physicians engaged, we wanted physician leadership, but what we didn't know is they weren't equipped the way we wanted. So we actually started a physician leadership academy here, and the two leaders of our perioperative surgical home went through this. They got 360 evals. They learned about hospital finance, quality, uh, clinic operations, leadership, and lastly, a lot of focus on emotional intelligence with an executive coach that met with them regularly. There were several physician leaders in our organization, but especially the PSH leaders. I think that's essential for equipping your leaders to have the skill set they need to lead. We work together as a team to set up predefined protocols. These are just some examples of a BMI protocol or pain protocol. We set up a number of these protocols so that we can make it reproducible and precise and then tweak it based on the accuracy and outcomes that we saw on a regular basis. Mike, do you want to go over some of the outcomes for surgical hip and knees? Thanks, Chris. So St. Vincent's uh, is part of the mandatory comprehensive care for joint replacement. They, it wasn't their choice to join the total joint bundle. CMS required them to participate in total hips and knees. And when we looked back at, in 2016 at our data and we compared our physicians, and this is just a snapshot of some of the physicians. This is for two hospitals and it gives a, a, a snapshot of what some of the different surgeons were involved in terms of their variation. The black dot is the target spend for Medicare for total knees and total hips for St. Vincent's Hospital. 
And O'Connor Hospital is going to be joining uh, the Bundle Payment Care Improvement Advance Program in October, so we've included them in this data for transparency for the physicians. So again, the black dot is the target spend for the Bundle Payment Program. The top cross is the 75th percentile, and the bottom cross is the 25th percentile. So it shows the variation. And if you looked at our surgeons across the hospitals in 2016, there was a widespread in SNF variation in the utilization. So some of the physicians averaged over $9,000 for their patients going to SNF, and others were, less, were around $1,500. So we looked at those leading practices by the physicians who had the lower utilization, and we've shared that. So, for example, we had over a six-week period, once we transparently showed with the orthopedic surgeons at St. Vincent's Hospital, what the differences were in utilization for a SNF and put into place some criteria to say as the patient leaves the hospital, we had a checklist. And so when they came in the hospital and even before they came to the hospital in the patient education boot camp, if you will, they were showing this is what you have to do, check these boxes in order to get home. And if they didn't check all the boxes, they would end up in a SNF. And over a six-week period, we decreased by 50% the utilization of a SNF, and we've been able to maintain that lower rate of utilization of a SNF. And in that six-week period, it was about a $60,000 savings, and we've been able to maintain that going forward. So that's just one example of how you can be successful sharing data. Here's another example in terms of sepsis. And again, there was wide variation in spend uh, by different physicians. And this is, again, just a snapshot. It's not all the physicians involved in sepsis because, as you know, Sepsis really impacts patients at all levels, all ages, uh, surgical, medical, and in all specialties are in, engaged and involved in this. And you can see, again, wide variation. And the whole goal for this perioperative surgical home concept, which you can use for both medical bundles and surgical bundles, is to reduce the variation and standardize the care. And so you can see wide variation in terms of the orange color is the LTAC and the purple color is the SNF utilization. The, blue, the dark blue color is your anchor facility or your, your stay in the hospital. There's more variation for the anchor facility for sepsis than there is for total joints. If you look back again at your total joints, it's much more consistent than it is for sepsis because, as we know, there's wide variance in length of stay. But more importantly, for post-acute care, there's wide variance in the utilization of post-acute care. And if you do it well and you really focus on your post-acute care, you can not only decrease the utilization of SNFs and LTACs, but you can decrease the utilization of emergency rooms and hospitals for readmissions because you're focusing on the ambulatory sensitive conditions that cause those patients to come back to an ED. This is an example of one episode of care for total joints, for example. So you have that pre-optimization phase where frequently you know six weeks or two months in advance before the patient comes to the hospital that they have agreed jointly with the surgeon to have a total joint surgery. And so in that phase, you want to take advantage of your primary care physicians and your uh, cardiologists, in this case, for a patient who has heart disease and, and have the anesthesiologist see these patients early. Don't wait for just the day before surgery or the day of surgery. And then as you go forward, you see all of these uh, steps along the pathway that the stay in the hospital and then the immediate time after they leave the hospital, they may come back for a readmission or reoperation, and then the post-acute care over the next 90 days. What I want you to see is that there's a little bit of a change here when you do this because what we've done with the one episode, for example, in the care redesign, as we move physical therapy out so that instead of just doing physical therapy after they leave the hospital, we actually moved it into the pre-optimization phase. And you can see that we've really tried to optimize the patients in that four to six weeks before they come to the hospital and then manage those patients after they leave the hospital so they don't have a, an ED visit or a readmission if it's unnecessary focusing on those ambulatory sensitive conditions, having physical therapy work with them as an outpatient physical therapist um, to rehab those patients to get back to the desired function. So that's really sort of redesigning the care through that four to six weeks before they come to a hospital if you're doing elective surgery, 
And if you're doing a, a more emergent surgery or a medical bundle, trying to focus on what they're doing in the hospital in the 90 days afterwards. So, uh, Chris, do you want to take us forward from here? Yeah, the, I want to talk a little about some of the outcomes we had at White River. And um, going forward, we've been talking a lot about discharge disposition and where they went afterwards. But I'll tell you, we found at our hospital the burn for our organization was the fact that back in 2011, we had a very high readmission rate for total joint replacement of the lower extremity. We had um, uh, our percentage was causing us to have a penalty based on value-based purchasing and hospital readmission reduction penalty, and it also wasn't the care that we knew we were able to deliver to our patients. It wasn't what we thought was indicative of the care they got at our health system, so we wanted to focus on that, and that's what the burn to get into the perioperative surgical home collaborative was for us. So move, we looked at the entire process. We standardized our pre-optimization, interop care, and post-discharge disposition. I want to show you first from 2013 data, we had about 50% of our patients for total joint replacement of the lower extremity, those are those DRGs, that were going home with home health. And then over 20%, probably close to 25%, were going either going to SNF or LTAC, which are skilled nursing facilities or long-term care facilities. And only, the, and only about 25% were actually going home with just self-care. And each year we worked on that, and as you see, by 2016, 80% of our patients were going home with self-care, and only 10% were getting home health and LTAC or SNF. And when you look at that off the gate, you're thinking, well, that's smart. You just abandoned your patients and had no post-acute care. Anybody could do that. And that is, that's why following that, we look at our length of stay, and we say, okay, we've cut down our intraoperative our intra-hospital stay from above three days in 2013, made incremental progress till 2015, and then it actually went up a little bit in 2016. And I want you to remember that because that was very a, a specific decision we made. We also followed length of stay during the time. What you see is we made great progress. Um, it was much higher even in 2011 and 12. So 2013, we were uh, about 8.7% made a decrease in 2014 didn't really make that much of a difference in decreased length of stay in 2015. And in 2015, we made the decision, hey, perhaps we're actually sending people home a little too early. So we tweaked a little bit with our meetings in 2015 what we were doing for discharge, discharging patients and kept them a little longer. That's what caused that increased length of stay for 0.3 days. But what that allowed us to do is cut our readmission in half. We identified those people that were at risk for an early readmission, and then we were able to change our processes to get down to where we think is a, a very good rate of 3% for readmission for total joint replacement of the lower extremity, and also have a discharge disposition that shows 80% of people going home, and I think without home health or OTAC or SNF, which I think is a very good place to be for an organization. Being, uh, from our standpoint, we reduced the total cost of care for an episode by over $3,000 per episode during this period of time, which we believe is uh, what was our burning platform to begin with, which it allows us to deliver the level of care that we thought we could, which is a low readmission rate, a decreased length of stay, getting people home quickly, letting them educate themselves with appropriate expectations, letting them get home to where they really want to be, and getting them back to their normal life as quick as possible. Mike, do you want to talk about some of the PSH outcomes while um, over the last collaboratives one and two? Happy to do that, Dr. Steele. So we've had two previous PSH collaboratives, perioperative surgical home collaboratives, and I was lucky enough to be the medical director for both of those collaboratives. And as Dr. Steele has outlined, his organization had significant uh, outcomes that were marked improvements in terms of length of stay and readmission rates and decrease in total spend. But many of the other organizations were able to do the same thing. And so if you looked at length of stay, these are just a few of the many examples where a Midwest academic center was able to decrease their length of stay for total joints. A community hospital was able to decrease their stay for colorectal surgery. Another community hospital was able to do that for, for total joints. 
and an academic center on the West Coast was able to reduce the length of stay for urology surgery so that you can see at both community hospitals and academic centers across the country, they were have, able to have significant decreases in length of stay for multiple different uh, bundles or perioperative service lines. The readmission rate, again, depending, we had pediatric hospitals that were successful using the perioperative surgical home model and academic centers and community hospitals in reducing the readmission rate. And again, the focus was often on those ambulatory sensitive conditions. What do I mean by an ambulatory sensitive condition? Diabetes, congestive heart failure, pneumonia, urinary tract infections, asthma, those are the kinds of things that bring people back to the emergency room in the hospital. And if you can provide better care in that post-acute care phase, and so in that first couple weeks, the first month after they are discharged from the hospital, if you look at their other medical conditions and manage those better, then you can avoid ED visits and readmissions that may not be related at all to the surgery, but the patient still has those problems, those chronic diseases that you have to manage. Some other outcomes from the first two collaboratives with the perioperative surgical home was post-discharge care in terms of increasing the number of patients going directly home, either with home health or without home health. And as Dr. Steele identified in his own organization, they were being very successful at that. And on many of other organizations, whether it's academic or community hospitals, were able to bypass the SNF and go directly to home. And when you do that and you take into consideration that if you bypass a SNF, you save about $500 on average per day in the SNF. And if people are staying in a SNF for about 20 days uh, on average, that can be a huge savings. And so if you also pay attention to those ambulatory sensitive conditions and have avoid those ED visits and readmissions, you can have significant cost reduction. And again, community hospitals and academic centers were able to have huge decreases in spend uh, based on bypassing SNFs and improving the quality of care so that they had fewer complications. In one of the things that we need to consider in palliative care and end-of-life care, uh, especially with some of our more complex patients, it's a difficult conversation to have with patients and their family, but some, not all, but some of our higher risk, highest risk patients this is a conversation that the primary care physician or the surgeon or other um, provider who is very close to the patient and their family may need to address. And I think it's important to consider this as part of your pathway because not all of our patients are low risk uh, or healthier patients. Some of these patients have gone beyond moderate risk to sort of end stage organ dysfunction. And it's important for their value of life to have these conversations with them and their family members. It's really, I think, our vocation to do that. Another aspect of care that sometimes is overlooked is behavioral health. And I've seen organizations across the country who've embedded behavioral health providers, whether they're advanced practice nurses or whether they're psychologists or psychiatrists, they embed a advanced uh, a behavioral health specialists into the primary care clinics so that when, as the patient is leaving, the doc says, hey, Mike, why don't you stop by Joe or Sally's office on the way out? And Joe or Sally is a, is a behavioral health provider that can help me with my access to care and to better manage my life. Now, if my doctor said, hey, Mike, I want you to go see a psychologist or a psychiatrist, i probably say, uh, I don't think so. But if I'm just going to stop and see Joe or Sally on the way out of my primary care physician's office, I'm more apt to do that. And really, behavioral health creates a lot of barriers for care. Sometimes they can't get organized to take their medications on a regular basis or see their physical therapist or their surgeon or their primary care physician. So please don't forget about behavioral health in your pathways. So Elise, I'd like to turn it back to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Schweitzer and Dr. Steele and Joe. That was a fantastic amount of information and I hope really helpful to everyone on the phone. So we wanted to point out a couple of resources about the perioperative surgical home model. First, there is a, a wealth of literature on the American Society of Anesthesiology website. So please do follow the link on your screen to that. 
Uh, and we also wanted to point out that the perioperative surgical home collaborative that uh, we shared some of the results and outcomes for, for the past iterations is operating in, in a collaborative as well, and that is a joint effort between the American Society of Anesthesiologists and Premier. So the application to register for that collaborative is open until November 1st, and that also has a, a wealth of resources and, and information, uh, both from members who have implemented these models as well as those who are just getting started. So now we would like to open it up for questions and discussion from all of you on the line. So please do feel free to chat those in to the Q&A tab on your screen. And we do have one question in the chat. Uh, the question is, who pays for the prehab PT? Uh, many insurers do not cover it. So Dr. Schweitzer or Dr. Steele, if you'd like to answer that. Um, I can speak to that to some degree, Mike. Um, that's a good question. We ran into the exact same snag on prehabilitation. It's something you're going to have to work out state by state based on the LCD for the specific insurance company. I can tell you we do a time to get up and go test in the orthopedic surgeon's clinic to determine the need for prehabilitation or not. And failure to ambulate um, was, was a code that, uh, sometimes would be paid for, and I say sometimes because every insurer is a little bit different, but you're going to have to work closely with the physical therapist on what codes will actually get paid. But in the end, it's a, it depends on if you're a physical therapist or employed by the health system or not, and then what specific uh, diagnosis codes will get paid where you practice. And I can tell you, though, it's worth getting with your PT to talk to them about because they do know what diagnosis codes are there. And a lot of times when you look at these specific patients, they actually do qualify for PT before surgery based on some of the codes. We just, in, as an anesthesiologist, I'm, I'm trained, uh, I'm not necessarily trained on knowing what diagnosis codes are indicated for PT. And that's part of the reason why you need to engage so many different stakeholders is to have physical therapists involved in this so they can help you with setting up the screening algorithm on the front end of who would get prehabilitation. Mike, do you have anything to add? Well, the other thing is depending on your payment model. So Chris identified a, a fee-for-service payment model and having uh, the medical necessity uh, documentation to get paid in a fee-for-service model. Out here uh, in Southern California, we have a capitated care model, and we, it's actually beneficial to us in a capitated model to pay the physical therapist to do that prehabilitation because if that prehabilitation can avoid a skilled nursing facility uh, stay, then we save a lot of money on the back end by a little bit of spend on the front end. Accountable care organizations have the same approach in terms of an ACO. It's all about the total spend for the year for an ACO, and so internally they might want to manage that where they have a physical therapist uh, manage some patients before they come to surgery in terms of helping them with their uh, exercises and so that they understand how to do those exercises after surgery at home so that they can avoid a sniff. And so some of those things, whether it's an accountable care organization or a capitated care organization or a bundled payment program, if you can, by having a couple of visits with a physical therapist prior to coming to the hospital, avoid uh, the utilization of a sniff, at the end of the day, you've saved a lot of money. And so internally, if you're not using the fee-for-service model, you can manage that separately and look at the total spend, and it's really a good return on investment. Thank you so much. And we got another question about uh, what type of additional resources did adding a post-op home care assessment or coordination require? Well, Dr. Steele, I think that you had uh, nursing students and medical students do some of those evaluations, didn't you? Yeah, we, we actually started a health coaching program for um, specifically worked with our joints for quite a while at our local college here where we taught, two, we taught one didactic class and then a clinical class that they got credit for and then used those college pre-med students to go in and specifically – screen these patients, actually go to their homes and evaluate their homes. They worked hand-in-hand -hand with our discharge planners and care coordinators at the hospital and did a little bit of legwork. So 
I encourage you to be creative. Uh, if you've seen one program, you've seen one. So you need to figure out all politics is local. You've got to figure out what works in your specific system. You clearly have to be able to screen these patients and know who your highest risk patients are. There's a myriad of screening tools out there to look at who's going to need what services and to risk stratify them. But then what services you deliver based on, or based on your payer mix, your resources, the mission of your organization, and a lot of those things. But I think the key is to get a perioperative surgical home type structure at your organization so you can have regular meetings with stakeholders to determine what your priorities are what you're going to focus on and how you're going to execute and then iteratively make improvements as time goes on. Joe, I'd like you to address the question regarding how you see physician specialty payments changing over the next five to seven years. You have a broad background in terms of the healthcare industry and where it's headed. Yeah, that's a great question, Mike, because uh, a lot of people – you know, are, are thinking about that right now. And, and kind of in the short term, um, you know, the next couple of years, we, we see the continued movement uh, towards episode of care payment or bundles for physicians. So moving away from um, just a single procedure payment, but paying a physician for uh, a total episode of care, whether that would be treatment of a congestive heart failure, uh, patient over time in the medical area, or, or whether it would be a procedural area, uh, treating the patient pre-procedure pre, 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 pre and post-procedure in addition to doing the procedure. And then longer term, some organizations that are talking about the idea of retaining and paying a retainer fee to a specialist, uh, to a panel of specialists uh, in an area. For example, they may have a preferred panel of gastroenterologists or hematologists that they would use uh, as their consult. So they would retain those physicians in their fee and then pay them uh, basically on the number of consults they might do or uh, number of uh, procedures even uh, in addition to the retainer agreement. So, so that, that's a, a model that uh, folks are talking about for specialists, both surgeons and medical specialists. Great. Thank you so much. And we do have another question in the chat from the audience. Uh, the Smith patient checklist for do total joint patients. The question is, would you be willing to speak a little bit more about this uh, or even share as a checklist? Well, I'll take that one. That's a great question. You know, this checklist is for our patients and their patient families really to address the cultural issue and the, and, the, and the social issue of, you know, my best friend went to a skilled nursing facility, how come you're going to send me home sort of concept. And so it's better, best developed locally. And what we did was we worked with our physical therapists and our case managers, and they used, you know, Milliman criteria or whatever uh, – uh, criteria they use in terms of case management at your hospital and working with the surgeons uh, and other clinicians we came up with a checklist that worked for our local community and addressed our local cultural concerns each local community may have a different cultural background in terms of uh, is it an Asian background is it a, a Hispanic background is it a you know northern European background in each cultural community has sort of different issues in terms of what the beliefs of that culture is, is in terms of being discharged from a hospital directly home or to a skilled nursing facility. So it's a combination of functional outcomes in terms of can they get up out of bed and transfer to a chair and can they move from their chair to their bathroom and back to bed. Those kinds of issues are sort of done best by a physical therapist, but a care manager and a social worker can help dress the community cultural resources and beliefs to the best of the knowledge. So I think this, this kind of checklist that you say, okay, if we check off all the boxes, uh, your grandmother or your uh, husband is ready to come home directly is better done at the local level, but you have to involve multiple stakeholders to get the best approach. Does that make sense? 
It does, and thank you so much for emphasizing that point. I think that was a key theme throughout the whole presentation about emphasizing the different stakeholders. So we've come to the end of our time today. Thank you so much again to our presenters and to the audience for chatting in your questions. We hope that this has been helpful for you, and we really appreciate your spending the time with us today. Our contact information is on the screen, and so if you have additional questions or feedback, we truly welcome hearing from you. And we'd also like it for you to take a moment to answer the brief survey questions that will pop up on your screen when the webinar ends. Uh, as we mentioned, we will have today's recording posted very soon to premierinc.com slash events, and we'll send an email when it's ready. Thank you again for joining us, and have a great rest of your day. Music